Chapter 5 Islam and Science Part 1, 2, and 3 The discussion of contributions of Muslims to the field of sciences and particularly to the development of Renaissance often comes up when we become aware of the texts from the antiquity that were translated by Muslims which in turn caused Europe to become reacquainted with the scientific knowledge of the past. The objective in this chapter is to investigate the conditions under which Muslims were able to accomplish what they did accomplish and to contrast those conditions with the current situation. Earlier, I mentioned the Islamic viewpoint to be open and inclusive of other people's knowledge and culture. There was also a sense of confidence that enabled them to study without being intimidated by the people or the cultures of the past. A third influential factor was the establishing of the Darul Hikmah or House of Knowledge during the Abbasid Caliph Al Mamun, who actively solicited purchasing of manuscripts and hiring of scholars. What is of interest to us, however, is the methodologies of medieval Muslims whose work resulted in the development of Renaissance. These methodologies included the understanding of the concept of the bigger picture, so to speak, and the language of metaphors on the one hand, and constantly pursuing the deciphering of the formulas through the language of abstraction or constructing those formulas, particularly mathematics on the other. Hence, for the most part, their theories were based on reason and the scholars were well versed in various branches of sciences. For this reason, they were called polymath or hakim. The interest in incorporating reason in religious concepts brought about a movement by a group of thinkers known as Mu'tazile in 9th century. Their perspective drastically differed from the traditionalists who argued for the concept of the quote-unquote eternal Quran, which implied and attached a supernatural quality to the Muslim holy book, thus making its entire content indisputable. The traditionalists' view basically left no room for discussion whereas the Mu'tazili promoted the idea of critical thinking and open discussion on the matters of faith. The Mu'tazilis proved to be influential in planting the seeds of wisdom which came to fruition through the appearance of giant polymaths such as Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi and Avicenna whose works in various fields of philosophy, theology and medicine are highly regarded even to this day. A very crucial development pertinent to the subject of this chapter is the development of Islamic educational system that underscores the Prophet's emphasis on education as an obligation for every man or woman in Islam. This was a revolutionary move for its time since education had always been reserved for the privileged and the elites and never open to the public. The opening of the first university in the 10th century in which initially a variety of subjects were taught while inspired the founding of other universities in Europe became the precursor to madrasa in Islamic regions that we know of today as strictly a religious school. Other institutions of knowledge also existed within places like hospitals, observatories or Sufi hospices. The fields that continued to be worked on under the sciences in addition to geometry, astronomy and astrology about which you will read briefly in your text included the subject of medicine. The sources of medicine in Islam are varied and include books such as the one written by Ishaq ibn Hunayn and other sources that came from Hippocrates and Galen that had the Greco Alexandrian roots, as well as Persian and Indian books on medicine. Muslims added then to the compilation of such valuable sources the Quranic guidance and Prophet's instructions. The manuscripts that were produced as a result included 
for the purpose of clarification the illustrations such as the diagrams of anatomy, how to set a dislocated hip, and even a caesarean section operation. A look at the surviving surgical instruments reveals that such instruments bear a striking resemblance to the current tools used by surgeons today. What I'm hoping you will take away from this chapter is to understand how different the approaches and methods were that the medieval Muslims used and that what resulted was the flourishing of knowledge in sciences, art and many other branches of education. What we see today, however, is a different perspective that is more exclusive rather than inclusive. Muslims in the region, mostly fundamentalists, have been led to feel threatened by those outside their faith and have been encouraged to act according to their fear. Rather than seeing themselves as an active part of the global community with an emphasis on reason like medieval Muslims did, their present oppressive governments or their powerful fundamentalist religious leaders prevent the natural involvement of democracy which has led to more oppression and lack of freedoms in the region. Such an environment is far from what the Muslims experienced during the Middle Ages in cultural centers, as a result from their works testify. Becoming aware of this contrast, is it any wonder then that the cultural and political climate in the region is what it is today?